And now our next talk, um, Peter Reki, Kiwimeki. I hope that was uh, the right pronunciation. <laughs> uh, automating open source licenses, uh, compliances. Thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Kivimaki. I'm the CTO of Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions, NIS for short. And my topic is automating open source license compliance. And my approach to the topic is very practical. I hope you saw the previous presentation because it provided very good introduction to this topic. So after that presentation, you should now know why this topic is important. And my presentation is more about how you can actually do that, how, how you can achieve that. But before diving into the actual topic, first a little bit of background. Uh, so first of all, my organization, NIS is a nonprofit association which mission is to develop digital government solutions to its members. And our members are Estonia, Finland, and Iceland. So we are developing open source software for European governments. Our main products are uh, X-Road and Harmony e-delivery access. They are both solutions for secure data exchange. And um, a few words about X-Road, uh, since uh, I'm going to use X-Road as an example how to, how to automate open source uh, license compliance. So, XROAD is an open source software and ecosystem solution that provides a secure way to exchange data. Uh, XROAD is licensed under the MIT open source license and it's also been uh, verified by the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Uh, all in all, XROAD is used uh, in 23 countries, or there are 23 XROAD ecosystems around the world. And in the countries where XROAD is being used, there are uh, more than 540 million people. So you can say that it's, it's truly a global solution. Uh, as you can see, <clears throat> Germany is also marked on the map. Uh, but in, in Germany, X-Road has been implemented by a private company, so it's not used uh, on a national level like it is in, in Finland and in Estonia. Uh, and X-Road is a generic data exchange solution, so usually when X-Road is implemented in the ecosystem, all kind of data is being exchanged uh, and uh, not like in many other cases where ecosystems are built around some specific domain like transport, healthcare, and, and so on. And uh, when it comes to NIS and its responsibilities regarding X-Road, you could say that NIS is the software vendor of X-Road. Uh, so X-Road is open source. Obviously, we are not selling anything. Uh, but when it comes to our responsibilities regarding the software, well, we have all the same responsibilities than, than a well, software vendor is. We are managing the source code, uh, developing the software, managing the backlog, providing documentation, helping new community members getting started, and, and so on. Uh, however, we do not use the software uh, by ourselves, and we do not host it either. So we just develop and distribute it. And uh, this is our current product portfolio. Uh, so X-Road and Harmony e-delivery access are, are the main products. But as you can see, X-Road also has, has a lot of extensions. Uh, like you can see, uh, X-Road and all the extensions, they are uh, licensed under the MIT license, while Harmony Delivery Access is licensed under, under the EUPL license. What's common uh, between all these different so pieces of software is that they all use third-party open source components that are licensed under various open source licenses. Uh, they have tens of direct dependencies and hundreds of transitive dependencies. And the products, they use different technologies and various package management systems. Most of them uh, are using Java, but we also have JavaScript, Python. Uh, we used to have some Ruby as well. So 
uh, not, not just one technology and one package management system. And then we also have some uh, vendor dependencies, so dependencies that are not managed using package management systems. And when it comes to open source uh, compliance checks until 2021, uh, we used to run these checks annually uh, only for X-Road, so, so once a year. And we have had this project-based approach, so every time when we wanted to run the check, we, we needed to have a tendering process and find a service provider, and then the service provider would run the check, and, and after that we, we have the result. And uh, the whole process took around three or four months every time, and it was only for X-Road, not for the extensions, not for Harmony, only for X-Road. Uh, so not very agile process, quite time-consuming, time and, and most of the time we didn't have up-to-date information available regarding the dependencies. Uh, and during one of these checks, uh, the vendor that was selected uh, proposed automating these compliance checks using uh, open source review toolkit ORT. And, and therefore, uh, we, we started a project which aim was to automate this process, obviously, to get rid of all the, all the manual uh, work uh, that the previous process required. So in, in 2021, more or less in, in two months, uh, we, we ran this project uh, with our partner, HH Partners, and um, uh, the, the aim of the project was to automate the process for X-Road and, and two X-Road ex extensions. And, well, actually, even before we, we decided to start this project, I, I thought that, well, implementing ORT it, it can't be so, so challenging. I'm a software engineer myself, so I was pretty confident that I could do it by myself, and I already had some, some configuration files that were used during the uh, prior compliance checks because the vendor that we used, they used ORT in internally, and they had shared the files with me. And I spent one uh, sun Sunday uh, trying to uh, get ORT uh, up and running with, with X-Road, and the result was that, well, uh, wasn't able to do that, and I thought that, well, it's, it's better to have, a, have someone who knows uh, ORT to, to do this thing for us. And also, uh, another thing uh, that is worth mentioning is that the project, it, it wasn't only about implementing a technology because, well, basically what uh, you do with ORT is that you automate the open source compliance checks. Uh, but before automating the checks, you actually need to know what, what do you want to check, what do you want to automate. You need to have an uh, open source policy and uh, then automate uh, that your projects are aligned with that policy. And Back then, we didn't have, have that kind of a policy document uh, yet. Of course, we, over the years, uh, we, we had some, uh, we had made several decisions, we had uh, guide, guidelines regarding certain things, but those things, they were never collected under a document that you could call an open source policy. And uh, that's why, actually, uh, the first step in the project was to create a written open source policy document for us and then use ORT to, to automate uh, checking that our products are, are aligned with. So about ORT, uh, well, it's, it's a tool that you can use to uh, automate open source compliance checks. Uh, you can uh, use it to generate the open source notices and software bill of materials, and nowadays you can also uh, use it for uh, running security checks, de dependency checks. So ORT analyzes and scans the project, 
and all of its de dependencies, and then evaluates the findings against the uh, machine-readable open source policy and, and license classifications. So the open source policy is usually organization specific. Each organization has its own policy, uh, but then uh, the license classifications. Uh, so what kind of license categories are there, like permi permissive, uh, strong copyleft, weak copyleft, uh, and what, what uh, different licenses go, go under those categories. Uh, so you need to have that kind of configuration available and, and usually uh, those classifications, they, they are uh, kind of uh, generic or common enough that they can be shared between multiple organizations. So for example, the license classifications that we are using, they are available on, online, not uh, under our repository, uh, but, but under another repository. And I know that several other organizations are using the same classifications. And uh, this is uh, the uh, workflow that we were using. So we ran ORT on our Jenkins regularly, usually once a week. And uh, well, for some of you, once a week uh, might sound quite rare. Uh, but at this point, I have to mention that uh, we release two planned XROAD releases per year. So for us, it's not really necessary to run it daily. But of course, if, if, you, if you release very often, then it's recommended to run it more often. For us, this frequency works just fine. Uh, then, after uh, running OR ORT, uh, you must review uh, the results for issues, technical issues and policy rules violations. So, technical issues are problems uh, regarding analyzing or, or downloading some of the dependencies. And then, for policy rules violations, uh, they are uh, issues or, or conflicts with, with your open source policy. Uh, we uh, used to do this work so that we uh, downloaded the results uh, on our own workstation and then uh, work locally to fix these issues because uh, after uh, fixing something, uh, you, you need to change the configuration files and probably you want to run ORT to see that, okay, the configuration changes. Uh, I, I made, uh, they, they were correct, now, now the problem is, is fixed, and then you can move on to the, to the next issue. And then once you have resolved all the issues, uh, then you commit uh, the changes to, to the configuration repository uh, and run ORT again on your Jenkins to verify that, okay, now, now also, also your CI tool uh, has the latest changes available and, and okay, uh, the results so that the issues have been fixed. And well, we are using Jenkins, but of course you could, you could use any, any CI tool as well. There is nothing Jenkins specific about this workflow. And then, uh, finally, uh, you have the uh, open source notices file that you can copy to your project's uh, source code repository. Or alternatively, you, you can automate that, uh, that part as well, but we, we did it manually. Then uh, some experiences. Uh, about using ORT, so uh, the initial configuration, it definitely requires prior knowledge of ORT. So uh, running a simple example project is, is easy, but uh, running, running a little bit more complicated project, like for example, XROAD, it's a Gradle multi-project with over 40,000 lines of code, uh, that wasn't so, so easy. And technical and legal skills are definitely uh, needed when, when set, setting, up, setting up everything and uh, open source knowledge is, is needed as well. Uh, so 
you, you really need to have uh, both technical and, and legal uh, people working together and they both need to have knowledge of, of open source because there are different, different kind of technical issues and, and then policy issues. And in our case, well, I'm, I'm a technical person, I, I have no legal background. We, we, in our organization, we have one legal person uh, who has no open source background. Uh, but fortunately, to, together with our partner, we completed the initial setup with, with their help, and then with, with their support, uh, we have been able to uh, run, run ORT quite independently without any, any bigger challenges. Uh, however, in the, in the beginning, I took some time to get the configuration right, uh, and we needed to try some different options. For example, uh, the scan results, they can be stored using different storage type. You can use Git or you can use Artifactory. Uh, the difference is that if, if the scanning fails for some reason, uh, when you use Git, uh, the results, they are stored in Git only after the scanning has completed successfully, the whole scanning, but with Artifactory, uh, the results are stored after each dependency, meaning that if the scanning fails with Git, uh, then none of the results are so far get, get stored and you need to start from beginning. And when you have a very big project like X-Road, it, it can be a lengthy process. Resolving issues and policy rules violations, it's relatively straightforward when there are existing configurations available. And in, in our case, our partner, they uh, uh, they resolved initially all the, all the findings there, and then it was kind of easy for us to pick up from there and use the uh, available configuration as, as example how to, how to resolve the findings. Then uh, about the documentation, it's, I would say that it's, it's a little bit developer-oriented or targeted to technical people. Uh, for example, some configuration values must be checked from, from source code files. They are not explained in the documentation, but, but well, uh, not, nothing, nothing too complicated. That, that hasn't been a big issue for us. Then about scalability. Uh, adding a new project that uses the same outbound license, it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, so XROAD is licensed under uh, the MIT license and all its extensions as well. Uh, it was very easy to add XROAD extensions once XROAD was, was already configured. Uh, but then uh, we built initially the configuration so that it, it wasn't designed for multiple outbound licenses. As you saw, we also have the Harmony product which is licensed under the EUPL license. So uh, we needed to modify uh, the configuration uh, a little bit uh, in order to make it work that we can scan uh, projects that have the MIT outbound license and the EUPL outbound license. But it's definitely doable, uh, but it's, it's better to take it into account uh, already initially when you set up ORT. We, we didn't do that. And then uh, it's very good to have support available in case you run any policy rules violations and, and technical issues that you are not, not able to uh, resolve by yourselves. But then there is also another alternative how to how to use ORT to automate uh, the open source license compliance uh, since uh, it's possible to run it as a service as well. So from 2021 until the beginning of this year, we were running our own ORT instance and starting uh, from January this year, we have been using ORT as a service. So there is a company uh, called Double Open who is uh, providing ORT as a hosted service. 
and uh, uh, we started piloting uh, the service with them last year. And uh, in the beginning of this year, we, we decided to migrate all, all our projects to the service and uh, shut down our own, own ORT instance because we felt that the uh, SaaS service, it, it was more, more convenient for us. So the service is, is based on ORT, it's ORT under the hood. And for example, we were able to utilize our existing configuration, some of our existing configuration files when we were migrating. So not everything had, had to be done from scratch. And well, uh, you can, what you can do with the service, well, the same things that, that you can do with, with ORT. Uh, but compared to your own instance, uh, the difference is that the service covers the infrastructure that you need to run ORT, onboarding new projects, resolving technical issues, and, and of course, providing support services. For example, if you need support in, in resolving uh, policy issues. And at least in our case, uh, uh, the usability uh, improved a lot uh, since when we used our own in ORT instance, uh, scanning X-Road, uh, the full scan, it, it took 18 hours. That is a very long time. And now uh, with the SaaS-based service, uh, we can scan X-Road in, in 10 minutes. Of course, it's, it's not the full scan. Uh, and uh, well, with our own ORT instance, uh, uh, the the, uh, well, not the full scan, but uh, then scanning, scanning again, uh, it, it, it didn't take 18 hours, but it still, it took hours. So it, it's a significant improvement. And, and for us, getting rid of uh, maintaining the infrastructure since uh, we were running Docker, uh, ORT in Docker, and because of our projects, we were not able to use the official Docker image of ORT. Uh, we needed to do some customizations on it, which me meant that uh, every time when we needed to uh, upgrade the or ORT version, it uh, required some, some extra hassle. And, and now with the, with the SaaS service, we've got rid of all that and, and we are very happy about it. We can concentrate on, on scanning the projects and resolving the uh, policy rule violations and, and that's it. So uh, to summarize, uh, overall uh, using ORT has reduced the amount of work related to open source compliance validation significantly. Uh, compared to what it used to be before. And in addition to that, we can validate all our products and not, not just one. And we also can have up-to-date notice files all the time and not only once a year, which is a really, really big improvement. Uh, and uh, well, now when, when we are using it, it's, it's also relatively easy to scale it to our new new products. So uh, it, it doesn't require a big additional investment to start using it with, with new new products, new new software, which is a really good good bonus. Uh, but overall, even if many things have been automated, of course you you cannot get uh, rid of all the all the manual work and, and you still need to have some technical knowledge and, and also legal skills combined with open source knowledge when, when you use ORT. Because, well, when you work with the policy rules violations, you, you, re, you, need, to, you need to investigate them and, and, <laughs> and understand what's causing them. Something, it's something as simple as, well, some word uh, in documentation that uh, is detected by, uh, by the analyzer. But then uh, in some other case, it might be that you have a dependency that has a license that is not compatible with your product. And in that case, of course, the situation becomes a lot more complicated. Fortunately uh, for us, we, we haven't faced that kind of 
that kind of challenge is mostly just false alarms. But still, every finding has, has to be studied and, and it needs to be curated. And then uh, finally, uh, like it was mentioned in the previous presentation, as, as well, there are also other kind of obligations coming from the, uh, coming from the open source licenses uh, that, that you must be compliant with, that, that you cannot automate, for example, making available uh, source code of the dependencies that, that license requires it. So uh, uh, that's, of course, something that you still, still need to do, do separately. And you can build additional tooling to automate it, or, or you, you can do it manually, or, or find some kind of a solution that enables you to, well, to, to meet uh, the requirements of the license, but still trying to minimize the manual work that you have to do in order to do it. So, thanks for listening, and I think that we still have some time for questions. Thanks a lot for your talk. First, I have one question in the online forum already. Have you heard of tools and tools to describe and automate policy applications like Hermine, Hermine-Fast.org? It takes ORT ev evaluated modules. It takes ORT evaluated models as input and compares it to policies. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've heard the name of the tool, but un unfortunately, I'm not familiar with it in more detail. All right. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Yes. So what is the source of the licenses for the dependencies? How did you get that? Uh, so Do you know? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the so, question? Um, to do the comparison to see if the li the license for a dependency is compliant, yeah. where were you getting the license for the dependency? Yeah. So uh, what ORT does is that it, it it downloads the source code of all the dependencies and and analyzes it. So it it doesn't only rely on the uh, let's say announced license uh, of, of the dependency, but it actually it, it downloads the whole dependency, analyzes the source code files, and, and then based on that analysis, it, it decides what, what's the license or what are the licensees. And maybe, well, Sebastian can, <laughs> can provide additional information because here in the audience we have, have the initiator of ORT. Um, I will forward to one more question, or is it related? It is, but it's Maybe. Fun. Okay. Yeah. We have a couple of minutes left. <laughs> um, thank you for the presentation. I just had a quick question regarding um, the X road. Do you deploy as a Docker and do you use OT to also analyze the Docker images or is just the application itself that is analyzed? Uh, so yes, we provide Docker images for X road, uh, but how uh, X, uh, X road is packaged in Docker so that we publish uh, Debian images for, for X-Road. And then uh, to create the Docker image, we use the uh, Ubuntu base image and install the Debian packages. And so we, we do not do any, well, Docker-specific analysis for, for X-Road. But while I was listening to uh, the previous presentation, I started to think that maybe, maybe we should do. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, uh, just a small remark on um, the last topic about providing source code uh, bundles if the license uh, demands for it. So actually, we, we do can automate this with uh, ORT uh, using proper license classifications and the downloader together with the source code bundler. So it's, it's already automatable. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, ORT hosted sounds great. I'm, I'm just wondering about the, the SAS product that uh, you are using now, is there a functional difference between this or is it basically just ORT hosted? And if it's different, my question would be whether the SaaS solution is open source or whether there's something proprietary to it. 
well, from, from my perspective, I mean, the basic functionalities, they are the same. Uh, but of course, uh, the SaaS product, it, it has some additional components, for example, uh, related to resolving the por policy rule violations, how, how you can do them uh, online using your web browser instead of modifying configuration files, files directly. I would be interested, do you also have a kind of dashboard so to keep the overview of how well your specific projects or modules are currently doing in matters of compliance? I mean, how many unreviewed findings are there so that the upper management or whatsoever can still keep the overview of how, how well all the departments or teams are doing? Well, we don't have any, any uh, kind of additional or custom dashboard, but ORT itself, it, it provides a web app uh, that you can use to review uh, the analysis results and, and you can quite easily see from there what, what is the current status, what, what kind of findings do you have, is everything all okay and, and so on. But uh, a dashboard that would include kind of all our projects in, in a single view, uh, that's something that we don't have, but we have to check each project separately. Thanks a lot. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but we have a coffee break now. So I'm sure you can continue over a coffee with the conversation. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you.